Thanks for being here. Of course, so glad to be here, man. So, obviously, you're an insane guitar player. Thank you. Which I'm sure you know. One thing I've noticed, though, mm -hmm. no one's mentioning your voice. Yeah. Why? I think uh, the guitar oftentimes overshadows everything, mm -hmm. you know, because it's it can be a lot for someone, especially if they've never maybe seen me play, and they go, man, the guitar, but truth be told, I've worked on my voice just as much as the guitar to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. and I can hear that as well. Thanks, man. Which is why I was really surprised no one's talked about it. Yeah. Easy, 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 yeah. Right, I was listening to the album uh, all morning and all last night, and all I could think about was this dude's voice is like the perfect mixture of like blues, soul, passion. The power is fucking insane. Thanks, man. And you've also got that naturally raspy vibe, oh, yeah. which usually comes from like a lot of Jack Daniels and smoking and, you know, that <laughs> yeah. kind of lifestyle. Yeah. So did you take on your voice at the same time as you started to learn guitar as well? No, actually. So I was, I started playing guitar when I was 15. Okay. It was all about the guitar. Then probably about 19 years old, I started to, I was going to all these jams and I was just playing guitar, you know, like we were talking about stuff we love. Like I would go up and I'd play Stevie Ray or Hendrix and stuff, but someone else would always be singing. But then I started to say, man, I should really start singing. I think it'd be a good idea. I moved to Los Angeles when I was 21 and I was like, I'm going to start a trio, a power trio. And my friend goes, well, who's going to sing? And I was like, uh, I am. And then it was like, all right, we, we booked a gig. And I remember I was working on my voice. I just didn't know what I sounded like. It's, it's almost like I had to start, like I started with the guitar. I, I basically went, okay, I need to figure out how to breathe right. Because I remember the first show I would like squeak. I'd go for something, I'd, you know? And uh, it took a long time to develop my voice. And once it started to kind of roll, I, I, I almost got so obsessive about it. Like my favorite singers, I would, you know, my all time favorite singers, everyone from Lane Staley to Paul Rogers to, I mean, there's a ton, Jimmy Dewar from the Robin Trower band. There's a bunch of randoms, but it took a long time for my voice to kind of settle in. And the natural rasp, man, sure, I love a, a shot of whiskey, but the reality is it's just from all the nights singing. And, you know, like right now, I'm on day 44 of a tour. So the rasp is at an all time yeah. high. <laughs> yeah. And I think if you play in Germany as well, they still smoke in those clubs, right? They did, yeah. So, they were still smoking. Yeah, so you still get the. The, the benefit of being like a smoking <laughs> yeah. blues player, but without the actual... Yeah, I get the second-hand version. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. This too, you know, the record, the, the self-titled record, that record, um, I could tell you a ton about that, but vocally, those were recorded with, you know, the producer I worked with, an uh, English guy named Eddie Spear, he, did, he doesn't believe in autotune, he doesn't believe in any of that, so that, what you hear on that record is essentially we would do three takes and we'd pick our favorite take. Nice. So that is as honest as it gets, man. Old school stuff. Yeah, super old school. I was actually going to mention this because I read an interview that you did and you said, and I'm paraphrasing, but you yeah. said, you know, I left the guitar on the amps to get that feedback. Mm -hmm. And that's a real, real like live piece of, of rock and roll when you're doing that. Yeah. And Slash, he was also a Gibson brand ambassador. Yeah. Such as yourself, which is fucking insane, Crazy. by the way. We'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, but he does the same with his solo stuff with the conspirators, Miles mm -hmm. Kennedy. They go in, they record live, and they do it the old school way. They do, do reel to reel and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's amazing that in this day and age, you've got someone like you who's just pure old school. Yep. And you're becoming recognized by like Joe Bonamassa, Zach Wilde. Yeah. And, and all that sort of thing, man. It's pretty wild. I mean, I remember uh, in 2016, this, this mini documentary came out about me playing guitar and stuff. And the next day, I got a phone call from Zach Wilde. And he goes, hey, man, I'm going on a tour. I want you to open it. No and I'm way. like, what? So I was on the road with Zach for like six months. Wow. And then I remember out of the blue, Joe Bonamassa hits me up. And he said, hey, man, you know, I've been checking you out online. And I see you have some tour dates. You're coming through Los Angeles. Come up and hang out. And like, then we became, you know, great friends, Nikki Six, all these different people where I think kind of maybe they were, what I think it was is they were maybe seeing a little bit of their, themselves in what I was doing. Yeah. It's, I call it like, it's like the blue collar work ethic, man. It's like, we, I'm not afraid to get in a van and go play 300 shows. Yeah. I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. I'm not afraid to meet every single person or to maybe play shows where there's 
a thousand people there or ten people. I'm I'm in it for the long haul, and I think with a lot of those those players, they recognize that and they see that I'm not scared to do that, and they go, yes, right on. Zach Wild literally said that about you. He he said. He said, I admire his commitment to blues yep. and his work ethic yep. is unquestionable. And for, for someone like Zach Wilde to say that, who did all the same stuff back in the day, yeah. went on tour with Ozzy, loads of dates, blah, yeah. blah, blah. To get him saying that about you now is crazy. It, it's crazy to me because I remember Zach and I have become amazing friends. And what's so funny, um, you're probably around my age, but I remember going to Ozfest and I think it was 2003 before I'd even played the guitar. And I remember we went early because I lived right next to where it was and we got these little passes for uh, like the second stage got to be in the front row. And it was the year Ozzy was headlining the second stage. And I remember being a little kid and watching Zach Wilde come out and I was somehow strategically right in front of his Marshall stacks. And I remember just being blown away watching that and I'm like, this guy's like an animal. Like, who I've never seen anyone like that. And this was like classic, like Zach beer chugging, yeah. you know, black yeah, label, yeah. like. And I was I was almost scared. And I tell him that story all the time. So it's pretty crazy, you know. Like the other day, uh, there was a flyer in a club, and it said, uh, uh, "What did it say? The, uh, the, the toughest man in the blues." And it said Jared James Nichols or whatever. I texted a picture to Zach, and I said, "This is pretty funny." And he goes, "It's true." And I, I just thought, you know, I, it really, uh, it means a lot to get the, the seal of approval from my heroes that yeah. turn into your friends. It's and, crazy. And to have that seal of approval at your age as well, like we are a similar, similar age, we're yeah. like a few years apart. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this as well, there's so many newer generations coming up now and they get music from TikTok or whatever, they don't get to grow up with like Steve Ray Vaughan records totally. or you know, Zach Wilde or Ozzy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So for you to come through now at your age in 2023 yeah. and still bring forward that old school mm -hmm. rock and roll blues all out, yeah. I'm gonna tour the world to death, mm -hmm. is just wild. Yeah. Like, like, why? Why did you decide to do this, man? It's such hard work. It's very hard and I think that I, I don't know if I truly decided to do it or it decided for me. What I noticed was as the years were passing by when I was in my early 20s and trying to figure it out, I noticed that there wasn't a ton of people doing that. Yeah. And I noticed that the trend was kind of, it was dead to go and play to 10 people in Nebraska and you know go out there and build it grassroots. But I kept thinking in my head, there was like this calling where it was like, you have to do this. You have to. This is this is everything you've ever wanted to do. And I didn't let the other side of my brain, probably the, the, you know, the, the more uh, cautious. Yeah. It's almost like I said to myself, I don't care what happens. I don't care if I fail. I don't care if people don't like what I do. I love what I'm doing. And if, as long as I can continue to do that. And I think now, like you said, more than ever in 2023, it rings true for me that you have to be all in and I, I want to be the uh, anomaly. I want to be the one that says, you know, people look like, even uh, a fan came up the other day at a show and he said, hey man, I asked uh, John Notto from Dirty Honey, you know, how do I break in and who, who can I look up to, to in the, you know, in the touring and the blues rock world? And he goes, you know, Jerry James Nichols. So to even have my friends see that, you know, I think now it's, it gives the fuel to the fire that like, that I've just begun. I mean, Joe Bonamassa said, I think about six months ago, he was at, um, is it Sound City Studio? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he was sounding like this Cadillac and he just casually just said, he's the greatest guitar player to come out in the last 25 years. Yeah. And I was like, holy shit, like that's an accolade to- Yeah, it's crazy, man. It's, and, and to be honest with you, I, I, I would never say Joe's a, a liar, but to hear those things, <laughs> I always, I always keep my ego in check because the reality yeah, yeah, is, yeah. you know, like, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm so, the, I'm so lucky to be able to do this, and I was so lucky to set up my life for an opportunity to shoot for my goals. Yeah, and it still, it like, it blows my mind though because Zach and Joe and Slash and all these people, Jerry Cantrell, to have them give me the nod. I'm like, really? Even the old school guys, you know, uh, Gary Rosington before he passed, or like any of these old school classic rock guys, you know, that I grew up idolizing, to hear them, you know, 
or to see them like playing one of my signature guitars. It's crazy. Joe yeah. Walsh. Joe Walsh plays one of my signature guitars with the Eagles. And I'm sitting here going, what planet am I on? I feel like the luckiest guy on the planet. Yeah, that's the kind of alternative universe yeah. where he's playing one of your signature guitars. Yeah, I remember waking up, my friend goes, I was at the Eagles last night. No. <laughs> Joe Walsh played your guitar for like six songs. And I'm like, wow. no way. Going back to your, how individual you are coming mm-hmm. up in 2023. Yeah. So you left-handed? Yeah, I'm left-handed. Okay, left-handed, but you really? played right. Yeah. Are you um, lucky? Nice. <laughs> so, great, I'm the only one out. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hendrix played upside down yep. guitars because mm-hmm. you can get left handed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't use a pick, right. which is also a bit of a Jeff Beck mm-hmm. vibe. So, your tone that you get out of a guitar yeah. is, is ridiculous. Thanks. I, don't, I genuinely I don't know how the fuck you do that. <laughs> I saw a rig rundown on um, Premier Guitar or something on YouTube. You yeah. played three, four or five different guitars. You got a different, like, you're like a different person on each guitar. Mm-hmm. That's wild. Yeah. Like your technique, your hand, tell me about how that happened, how it came to be. Yeah. If something inspired you to do it. It's, it's simple. Like you said, I'm left-handed, right? So when I picked up a guitar, I wanted to play lefty. Yeah. The music store that I, my parents got me, my first electric guitar, it was like the $99 starter pack, guitar, cable, picks, the strap, the amp, and it came with a free guitar lesson. So okay. I go in, and I'll never forget the coolest guitar teacher I could ever ask for. His name's Craig Fremoth. He was playing a Bumblebee, Eddie Van Halen, and I walked in and he goes, wow, da, 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 da. you know, he's doing tapping. And I just, I'm like, how are you doing that? So I go in with my guitar and I'm holding it like this. And the first thing he does, he goes, hey man, flip your guitar. And I'm like, flip it. So I go like this. So you go for the left handed. Yeah, I went for the left handed. Right. And then I flip it and then he goes, he gave me this speech, he goes, Playing guitar, it's like a right hand world. And he goes, you're gonna have a hard time finding a guitar. You're always gonna have to have your own guitar. You can't go jam with someone, you know? Yeah. So at the time, man, I never expected to become a guitar player for my, you know, that would be my life goal, you know? So at this time I was like, yeah, sure. And then he handed me a pick and I was playing with a pick, but I was like, this feels weird. Right away it felt weird, but I tried and I tried and I played with a pick and I got pretty good at it for about two years. Mm-hmm. But what I noticed was I started to use my fingers and I was like, I love the way that sounds. Yeah. And eventually I started to hide the pick and just use these fingers. And people would say to me all the time, like, hey, if you're gonna be an electric guitar player, you gotta use a pick. You know, all professional guitar players use a pick. Yeah. And I started to get that angsty thing where I'm like, mm, whatever, you know? So I remember the day I was playing a gig I didn't have a pick and I was in a bad mood. And I said, whatever, I don't need a pick. And I played, right? And all of a sudden I started to use multiple fingers and I was like, it didn't, it didn't feel foreign anymore. It felt right because it felt like, you know, like on this hand, if you were to wear a glove and you couldn't feel your bending or how you're playing, you'd be like, this feels weird. Yep. When I had full control of the guitar, it was like, that's what I was looking for. So I dropped the pick and I had no idea what I was gonna do. So I just started to teach myself. No one taught me how to play without a pick. I just started to go, well, that sounds good. And through, you know, eight to 12 hours a day of practice, being a crazy kid, I would learn. I was like, okay, if I, if Steve Ray Vaughan did that, and then I do this, if I use my fingers, it sounds like this. And I started to kind of almost get my own sound that way. Kind of cool. It's awesome, man. <laughs> because again, it goes back to the, everyone, every guitarist now, is a traditional guitarist, right? Mm-hmm. They're right, uh, right-handed, they play with a pick, yep. they follow the same normal scales, minor pentatonic, they go through the same motions, and right. they probably look up to like maybe one or two guitarists. A lot of guitarists don't really fully go back into blues mm-hmm. all the way. Totally. You know? Even a lot of guitarists I speak to, they're not even, they're not crazy about like Steve Ray Vaughan. And I'm like, how oh, yeah. can you not be crazy about Steve Ray Vaughan if you play blues and rock music? Man. Man. Like, like Texas Flood is one of them greatest records ever how, how can you not be how can that not be like you know yeah the, the pinnacle that you look up to stevie was the first one when i found stevie i remember so like i was saying i grew up right next to where stevie's played his last show yeah my mom has a, a famous story but they were, my parents were building their house my dad built our house and she said that we were there that morning i was a baby i was maybe two years old and she said that she distinctly remembers the uh 
um, the ambulance is rushing by, and then she oh, she sees the coroner coming by. That's how close we were to where it happened. Wow. I had an uncle that was one of the first responders. And it's just so crazy because when I found Stevie, it was like, that was the first eye-opening moment where I was like, wow. And I was obsessed. And then Stevie led me down that path. I said, well, where did Stevie get it, you know? And then I was in a Buddy Guy, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, Albert King, BB King, Freddie King, Otis Rush, like the real deal blues. Yes. And then it was like I found something that none of my friends knew about. It's like, yeah, everyone's heard Zeppelin, whatever. But when I found this, it just changed the game. Can you remember the first Steve Ray Vaughan song? Or like, okay, go. Oh, go, man. Go. The first one I ever heard was Texas Flood. Okay. And was I was it live or studio? It was the studio version. Okay. And I remember hearing it and I was like, damn, you know? But then I, I remember my friend's dad had Steve Ray Vaughan live at Elma Combo on tape, which was his 83 performance in Canada at this club. And if anyone hasn't seen that, go watch that because when I watched that tape, it was almost like, it was like Stevie in the best form possible. I couldn't believe the sound he was getting out of the guitar. I watched that every day going to bed from the time I was 15 years old till I was 19. Every single day I watched that clip, that, that concert. It's just, yeah, when I found Stevie, it, it just shook me. And it wasn't even the fact that I wanted to sound like Stevie or, or you know, I wasn't like, I'm gonna be a Stevie Ray copycat. Yeah. It was just the power of the music was almost so overwhelming. It was like, that's where, that's where I wanna go. Yeah. I'm gonna tap into that. So it was a feeling, it wasn't, you're like, you didn't wake up and like, oh, I wanna be a rock star. Never. You just felt the music. I mean, dude, the thing is, when, you hit, when I hear you play, the, the emotion that comes out of your guitar is so blindingly obvious that it's deep within you. Yeah, man. There's nothing about, oh, I just wanna be a rock star, I wanna be famous. It's just pure, like, passion coming I, from, I, yeah. from your guitar. Well, thank you, and I tell people all the time, like, the, the living situation where I grew up, right? Um, I was destined to become a, a mechanic or a farmer. Yeah. Um, There's no person that I knew that even played music remotely for a living. I had no idea of being a rock star or having any sort of fame. It was simply the love of the music that brought me honestly to where I am today because even, you know, like I said before, this DIY, do-it-yourself thing of being on the road, it's not like you're you're going out there and you're making all this money. It's like, no, I'm yeah. doing it because I love it. Yeah, you're not getting limos to, no. to shows and it's stuff like, like that. It's like, even up until two, three years ago, I was driving myself to yeah. my shows to the point where it was like, all right, I got six shows in a row. You guys relax in the back. I'm getting us there. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's just, it's simply the fuel of, of just that desire, man. Yeah, and this is something that I've already said, I think it's very much lost on younger generations coming through. I've done the same, man. I've been on tour. I've slept in the back on like, on amps, on oh, yeah. stacks and stuff like that. <laughs> and even though, yeah, it's not the most luxurious thing on the planet, it's such an experience. And I think it shapes you as a musician. Absolutely. And I think a lot of that that you've been through, all of that comes through in your playing as well. Like you, Thank can, you, you can hear it. Thank you. It's not like you were just some like rich kid that was just given classical guitar lessons. And then yeah. you can feel every note you play is just, embedded in you man and I feel like I feel like that's the most honest way to represent the music is when I play I want people to feel that I want them to to realize that you know like you said you don't have to be a trust fund kid or you don't have to have the nicest guitar you don't have to be the cert you don't have to look a certain way even it's like just be yourself and the power of the music is that's what shaped me yeah that's what brought me to where I am now and now it's to the point where the power of the music is crazier than the power that I feel for it. So now it's like, as this is growing, it's like, now I'm like, all right, cool. Now it's like, it's really time to play. Yeah. You know? So there's a song on your album. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's called Down the Drain. Yeah. And I heard it last night and it was driving me insane. Thanks. Because I couldn't, I couldn't, like, I couldn't put my finger on it, but it really, really reminded me of some sort of random song or band from the 90s. And I was like, what the fuck is that? I'm like, it really reminds me of something. And it hit me this morning when I was on the train coming here. And it was the only Motley Crue record without Vince. Yeah. It was with John Karabi. Yeah. And it reminded me of that whole album. That's a great record, actually. Yeah. And specifically, like, record. Hooligan's Holiday. Yeah. I was like, shit. And it clicked on the train. I was like, this reminds me of, like, Hooligan's Holiday, man. Dude, yeah. So, like you probably... When I was a kid, 
you know, before I ever found the blues or Stevie or anything, 90s radio, where I grew up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alice in Chains, Soundgarden, I'd hear that, I, it, everything from, you know, all the classic stuff to like bands like Jackal and really random stuff that they play in the Midwest on the radio. And so that was kind of in my blood even when I picked up the guitar. And down the drain, that's a funny one because when I broke my arm, I remember I was, I basically had to almost relearn how to do finger style. Yeah. You know? And I remember I would play that riff. Like I would just do, 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 just to try and get my feeling back. And I walked into a room one day with a friend and I started to do that. And it was just like almost subconsciously. And he goes, what are you playing? And I was like, I don't know, the most cliche thing I could ever play, <laughs> yeah. you know? And uh, he started to kind of like sing this melody over it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I swear to you, within 10 minutes, we wrote down the drain. No way. And I never, ever expected it to go on my record or be a song. And I remember someone got a hold of it that he worked with. And they're like, oh, this is a great song. This is great. And then I, and he like doubled it back to like my manager and all these people started loving this song. And I'm sitting here going, what song are you talking about? And then they're like, we got to record this for the record. So that's how that one came out. No way. So that's funny, man. Cool. And we recorded like, like the whole record. We recorded it live, straight to tape. Yeah. I sang over it. Amazing, man. So it's cool. I mean, going back to those like 90s influences, I do believe you've got a, a cover coming out. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's, and that's a crazy story too. So that was almost one that, I, that was never to see the light of day either. Yeah. We were jamming, me and my band were jamming. And a lot of times in my live show, I'll throw in a few covers like near the end because I feel like there's something awesome about a cover where you play it how, I, I try and make it my own. You know, it's like, sure, we can stay straight to the form, but I try and make it sound like a song that I wrote. So we would do like War Pigs, Mississippi Queen, just fun stuff to jam on, Man in the Box. And I remember we were at Sweetwater, which is a big, uh, big music company in uh, America, and they have this crazy studio. So we're in there, dude, and we're in there after hours, we're jamming. And this place, they have everything. So I was like, you guys have a talk box? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they got me a talk box. And I started to mess around with Man in the Box. And we were like, let's record it. So we recorded it in probably an hour, did, did all the parts live together, and I sang over it. Yeah. And I didn't really think anything of it. And then yet again, it got it made some around a circle. And they were like, man, we should release this. And I'm like, really? Really? You want to release that? And I love the cover. Of course, I, that's one of my favorite songs ever. But it's just kind of cool how uh, full circle that is. Because I remember being a, you know, like many, a seven-year-old kid going, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And it, to me, that song is so bluesy. Yeah. That to me is like, there's... Like the, that 90s style of rock, it, it's so bluesy to me because it feels, it has all that groove and that vibe. I don't know, it's like, I just love it. I think the whole, the whole grunge thing was generally just like blues, but a lot more stoned. Yeah. And that's pretty like, much what grunge is, man. Grunge is like, to me, it's like a darker 90s version of the blues where it's yeah. like legit these, and a lot of it, you know, all those songs are about, they, they all, it's all in the same vein and it's just heavier and it's more aggressive. It's sometimes down tuned. It just feels good. So I love that shit. It's that kind of Seattle vibe of, uh, I mean, I'm sure you probably know all about the kind of grunge movement. It's all from Seattle. It was yeah. like a downtrodden place for all these kids. They had nothing to do, mm -hmm. but basically just get a little bit high and play music. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to what I was saying about soul coming through music. Yeah. The grunge was the same thing, man. That was just pure soul coming out of people like Cornell and Staley and oh, yeah. all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely, man. I think that that music is uh, a lot of people kind of like the blues. Maybe they would put it down and, and try and label it really quick. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. It's 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 powerful, dude. It's I mean, powerful. It was uh, it's the same as like Soundgarden, right? Everyone called them grunge. Yeah. But they constantly were like, we're not grunge. We're not grunge. No. It's like we're a little bit. <laughs> I'm tiny bit. Tiny you're kind of one of the biggest grunge bands. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one of the biggest. So you know. But yet again, the songs. All all those bands had amazing songs, and it came down to obviously killer musicianship, killer songs with the right emotion. How do you transition blue? Because obviously your record, like obviously it's very, very blues heavy based. Mm -hmm. And the, oh, the title, the, the first song as well, My Delusion, the yeah. solo on that is fucking insane. Dude, all that Ridiculous. stuff, all that stuff, live on the floor. 
Every single solo. Right, you know what? Uh, you, I'm sure you know Rick Beato. Oh yeah. Right? So he his latest interview with uh, Envy Malmsteen. Yeah, I want to watch that. Yeah, Dude, it's so I got to watch that. It's so good, right? Rick talks, he says like 20 words in like an hour. Yeah. But he's still the most interesting person like on YouTube. To watch. <laughs> yeah, man. But like uh, he was asking uh, Envy Malmsteen, he's like, do you play the same solos that you record in the studio which you do live? And he was like, no. I just improvise everything. Mm -hmm. And I've got a feeling it's probably very similar to what you do. As yeah, well. to, to be honest, I'm, I'm almost like kind of like skating on, on both sides of that because a lot of times, if I'm in the moment, I'll just go for it. Yeah. I'll just totally go off on a tangent. Someone actually asked me recently, they're like, do you play the same solos that you've recorded? And fun fact, every single solo that I've ever recorded, especially on the new record, I'm doing it live on the floor. It's, it's the feeling, it's the emotion, it's being in the moment. So like that My Delusion solo. Yeah. When the band does the break, I was like, okay, what am I gonna do? And it's just like, it just came out. And a lot of times what I'll try and do is I'll, I'll take like the peaks of the solos and I'll just work around them, you know? So it's like, I'll hit that first one. And then the second one, it's like, let's see where I can go. To me, music is really like, especially guitar, it's like flowing water, man. It's like playing a solo. It's like, it's like dominoes. I'll hit one and it'll just go wherever it wants to go. I think that's the beauty of it is the spontaneous creation. I know that sounds really heady, but like just being in the moment and just letting the music flow out of you. It's pretty cool. I think the phrase like being in the moment has been taken to be kind of a bit of like a hippie kind yeah, of thing yeah. by a lot of people. But if you're actually a guitar player, mm -hmm. you see that it, that's a real thing. Like that's not someone just going, oh, I just feel, you know, this no, is no, no, like, no, no, that's no. a real thing. Like when you're playing, yeah. you don't get to dictate what your fingers really do. And it's, yeah, it's almost like, I often say it's like, I'll have a, a thought and before that thought is even processed, it's coming out, Yeah, you know? It's almost like the, uh, like the Bruce Lee thing. It's like, when I play the guitar, I want it to almost just be like, I shut my brain off and it just kind of comes through. It's like, it comes through your brain to your heart, to your hands, through the speakers, to the microphone. And it's like, that's the most pure way because a lot of times you'll crash and burn and maybe it's not gonna come out cool. Yeah. And that's, but it, as long as you're not afraid of a failure, you know, it's like, embrace it. And when you're in that moment, a lot of times that's where the coolest stuff happens. All of a sudden I'll hit something and it'll make me just, you were you know, like, what the fuck was that? What, what did I just do? Yeah. Oh man, and then I'll, I'll double down do it again, try and take it higher, or you know, and it, that's where it gets really exciting. So yeah. we'll be on stage, man, and sometimes I'll play a solo, and, and I'll go off for five minutes on, on an idea, and you know, all the band will be almost to a whisper, and you know, it's just that feeling. It's, it's, there's nothing like that in the world. And, and Slash, he's one of the greatest, obviously, but you can tell, like you said, when someone's in the moment, and even for me, like, if I'm really feeling it, it's almost like, I'm not even, I'm just almost letting it just come out. It's yeah. like you're not even thinking about it, and then someone will come up to you and say, "Man, that's all we did." Or I'll see some a clip, and I'll be like, "I don't even remember." Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like you're just like I was just in the, my head was just full in the clouds, just you know what I mean? And if someone asks you to play that exact same solo, you can't do it. Like, no, that's not gonna happen. Like, <laughs> That'll no, never happen. No. <laughs> hey, Lizzie, it's your friend Jared. I'm in Stockholm, Sweden, right now, and I have a question for you. Could you tell everyone what the first riff you ever learned was? And also, what your favorite riff to play on stage is? I love you, Lizzie. See you soon.